for being a part of our services. I, have, I see a couple of visitors with us today, and we are grateful that you have come out to worship with us. And uh, one of the things we say around here as part of who we are is you're only a visitor the very first time. You're a part of the family after that. And so we welcome you to the, the church, to the family, and we're just going to have a good time. We're going to uh, sing a few songs this morning. A couple of them are relatively new. Uh, so if we struggle a little bit, you just guys just sing right through the middle of it and just go on with it, okay? And well, let's just worship him through all of, our, all of what we do this morning. So let's stand with me. This song you can't sing sitting down because it is stand up, stand up for Jesus. So let's sing it together. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer loss. From victory unto victory, his army shall he That's talking about putting on the armor of God, standing up for him, doing what is right in the face of all the difficulties that we have. Here's another great, beautiful song. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in. again. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from So 
if we're going to stand up for him, we're going to have to lift his name on high. Is that right? We're going to have to let, uh, allow and, uh, and let him work through us and do those things. And this is another beautiful song, and Nathan's going to start this off, I think. This is one of those we worked at this morning. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you lay down your life that I would be set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me. Interesting song, good song, right? Who brings the chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who makes the with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Back to the chorus. This is amazing rain. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. The King who conquered the grave, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Another more higher. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered. Now give me all of it. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for I just love the words to the song, and I hope that we continue to sing it more and get more used to the song, and you guys can help us and just uh, cover me up when I mess up like that, okay? <laughs> but it's just a beautiful song talking about what he's done for us and how we need to worship him and continue to worship him. Here's another one of those beautiful new songs called my, uh, Shout to the Lord. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. All every breath, all 
that I am never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound. of your mighty love, my comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship. praise to the king mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name i sing for joy at the work of your hand forever i love you forever i'll stand nothing compares to the promise i have oh Nothing compares to the promise I have. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for giving to us your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for us. Lord, I pray that you would just be with uh, Sam as he brings a message to us this morning. Just uh, hiding behind the cross, use him in a way that honors you and glorifies you. We love you and praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Nathan. Enjoyed the new music. What about everybody else? Okay. I'm used to a room full of teenagers. There we go. I was going to say, I'm used to a room full of teenagers. I'm not used to quiet. So, bear with me. You know, I came today, I was going to talk about idolatry and spiritual warfare, and it was funny, about Tuesday, my right ear started feeling plugged up, eyes got all swelled up, I went to the doctor, and I'm like, hey, I think I got a sinus infection. She's like, oh, there's no thinking, you do. So, a couple of rounds of Rocephin later and a steroid shot, I'm starting to feel better. But, I find it funny how the devil attacks, and when he chooses to attack. So I wanted to come and speak today uh, just on idolatry and spiritual warfare. Something I notice a lot, especially with our teenagers, they're under a constant attack, especially when we have these little things right at the palm of our hand. They're great. They are the world's biggest distraction. And so when we think of idolatry, we think of the golden calf or worshiping other gods. But really, in this day and age, Webster's Dictionary says God or an idol is whatever you make your supreme being. And for a lot of us, we make our supreme being something that's not necessarily bad. I see it with the kids, sports, band, football, 
work, love, compassion. So really wanted to look down at Romans one twenty one. If they throw that up on the board for me. There we go. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became frugal in their speculation, and their foolish heart was darkened. How often are we turned away by idols? You know, the promise of comfort, power, pleasure, even religion. And all good things, unless turned into something ultimate. Nothing I name there is a bad thing but it can turn bad if we put the gifts above the gift giver. Um, so one of the things I always tell the youth is if you can't crush your idol or if you can't give it up, it owns you. And once it owns you, it has you. And the hardest thing to do is break that. And then you get into your counterfeit gods. I'm going to use Brady because I know he'll be okay with it. Brady can sit there and zoom in on that phone for 45 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half, and not hear a single word I said. But I try to bring him into a conversation, and it is like a ping pong on the walls trying to get him to focus. I see it because I got it. I'm the same way. You throw me in front of a game console, I can sit there and play with the kid for three, four hours straight and not even realize I've been there that long. But I've let that become my idol. Again, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. One of the things you learn about a counterfeit God is that if you fail them, they will never forgive you. And if you get them, they will never satisfy you. And idolatry isn't just one of the many sins, in my opinion. It rather, it is the root of the sins. Because idolatry leads to so many things. Sex, religion, power, comfort, again, in God's time and in the right place, all good things. But idolatry can lead you down that road of turning away from the giver and focusing on the gifts. Everybody here has probably seen the uh, health, wealth, and prosperity gospel by now. I haven't found it yet in the Bible, but if somebody could tell me where I can find a beamer because I believe in Jesus, I, I'll take that, but I haven't read it yet. But, there are Christian preachers out there that preach that. That is idolatry. That is our new golden calf. And so there are 100 million different symptoms, but at the root of it, it is idolatry. So my challenge, one of the challenges I give to the youth, is turn off the TV, log off Facebook, turn down the music, uh, and turn your eyes towards the Lord. Go to the Bible and see how long you can do it. Try to think at camp, no music, no nothing, just pray. Yeah, they thought five minutes of prayer is like 30 minutes. And it, it's sad because we go and play a video game for 30 minutes and think it's five minutes. I'm guilty of this again. So a challenge would be unplug that console, unplug that football game, unplug watching baseball for a Sunday or a Saturday, and just focus on the Lord. One of the hardest things to do is to identify your idol and then replace it with Jesus. One of the things I try to tell them is accountability partners. They've heard it beat into their skulls a hundred times. Go to your accountability partner because somebody's going to see where you're falling short quicker than you're going to see where you're falling short. The combating idolatry, as it is the root to all other sin, isn't just to turn to Jesus it is the only way. As he exchanged himself for us, he was the ultimate veteran. He went and died on the cross for our freedom. And not just our freedom that we have here in America, but our total freedom against death. So let's make our hearts anew. Jesus said, if you try to gain your life, you will lose it, but lose your life and you'll gain it. The devil is at his best when he's going for deception. How many people in here are hunters? No hunters? One, two? Two honest people? All right. We live in Granbury. How many people out here are hunters? Same two. All right. Nathan? All right. The devil, to me, is one of the best deer hunters. 
because he leads on deception. He's going to put out that salt lick or that corn or whatever it is that you think might be a temptation for you. And for everybody, temptation's different. But the devil's sneaky. He's not going to come on a head-on attack. His greatest trick was making everybody believe he's not real. So one of his continued tricks is deception. He's never going to come from a mile away where you can see him coming. And idols are going to overpromise and underdeliver. We make good things, God things. Repeat that again. We make good things, God things. That's what makes it an idol. And then idols also operate through deception. So we need to put God in his rightful place. One God comes through when you need him, and that's Jesus. So do y'all see where I'm getting as idolatry is the root of all sin? If the devil, who is the greatest deer hunter, is going to be able to lead through deception, and idols lead through deception, then the root of it is Satan. An idol is dead, it's not alive. An idol doesn't give, it takes. Idolatry is a perfect example of spiritual warfare. And spiritual warfare is mentioned 31 times in the Bible. Jesus is alive. Jesus gives, he doesn't take. Jesus dies for us and is risen again for our sin. An idol is dead, not alive. An idol doesn't give. So to understand idolatry and spiritual warfare, we must first acknowledge that there is a war. And I understand that in this day and age, not everybody agrees with the terminology of war, but let's break it down into something smaller, and that's a battle. And a battle, by definition, out of Webster's Dictionary, is involves combat between two persons or between factions, between armies, and they consist of any type of extended contest, struggle, or controversy. So as Christians, we're in a spiritual battle on a daily basis. Has anybody ever said that? Satan's attacking me today. Excellent. So in warfare, battles are fought on different fronts for different reasons and with varying degrees of intensity. The same is true in spiritual warfare. Our spiritual battles and warfare are real. But it's hard when it's an unseen realm. Can we all agree on that? Again, I'm used to teenagers, I, but now y'all are yelling at me. Thank you, thank you. So it is hard because it is an unseen realm. And it's true with spiritual warfare that we cannot physically see the attacker but we can educate ourselves on how battles are fought and how they impact our daily lives. All we have to do is ask, why do we even want to fight? It will do us no good to educate ourselves on battle if we see no reason to fight. War is very controversial today, even in this physical realm. It's a controversial thing. Those attitudes, beliefs, and convictions will transfer over into the spiritual realm. However, in the spiritual realm, there's a battle going on regardless of our opinion. We are either victors or victims. Sorry, I'm not used to this microphone. There we go. So we're either victors or victims. Jesus has come and conquered, and the war is already won. That's the one thing we've got to remember. The victory is already there. The war is happening. It's just are we going to be tempted by the devil? Or are we going to fight alongside Jesus? So in Matthew 28, 18, Jesus says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Wow. We have that privilege of having the eternal relationship with God. Many of us enter into this covenant of salvation by grace. But Matthew 20 and 18 verses is not only about salvation. It is also about our everyday victories, which add up to a victorious life with Christ. Every day, victory is achieved by knowing, believing, and understanding the battles that are enduring daily, regardless of the passive or active battles that we realize that we see. 
So how many parts are there to a spiritual battle? I'm going to go ahead and cut to the chase. There's three. There's the spiritual battle, there's the worldly battle, and there's the battle within. So I'm going to touch on part one real quick. And again, this was a three-part message series that I tried to condense down into one service. So we're going to take this plane, fly around a little bit, and hopefully land, and it's all going to make sense by the end. Thank you. So, especially as the pilot. So, how do we know that there is a spiritual realm if we cannot see it? Well, how many of us are believers, and even unbelievers today, that don't want to deal with the world that we cannot see when the world we see is hard enough to deal with? So before we can discuss the spiritual battle, we have to believe in the spiritual realm. And we have the tendency, I love my daughters to death, but they can drive me nuts. Start yelling at them, and they'll run in their room, and they'll just throw a sheet over their head. And they're like, I don't hear dad, dad's not real, dad's not yelling at me. I did nothing wrong. No, you were just doing a cannonball on the dog, I saw it. Come back here so I can finish yelling at you. Well... A lot of times, I feel like we're guilty of being that little girl, in my case, my daughters, who we just want to throw the sheet over our head and be like, nope, there's no spiritual realm. Nope, Satan's not attacking. It's all good. I'll just keep this here. It'll go away. Oh, yep, it didn't go away. So, believing that no one can see her, just talking about my daughter, because we can't see them. Rabbits are the same way. I don't know if anybody's ever raised rabbits, been around rabbits, but if you'll just tuck them behind your arm and pet them, they're as calm as can be because if they can't see you, they have no fear. And just because we can't see the spiritual realm does not mean that it's not there. So let's step back a minute and assess what we do believe as Christians. It took faith to believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, yes? Yes. We walk by faith? Yes. Do we see Jesus? No. Do we see his daily interference? Or I should use the word interference. Do we see his daily occurrence in our lives? Yes. Do we see Satan's daily interference in our lives? Yes. So we believe God was raised, raised Jesus from the dead, and we believe he's alone is the source of our eternal salvation. So that right there shows us that there is a spiritual realm. Because not only did he defeat the physical realm, he defeated the spiritual realm. It is done. So all those beliefs that are not physically seen by us today, we believe Jesus accomplished these things in the spiritual realm. When he lived in the physical realm on earth, we know that we too need to believe in this physical realm to be welcomed into a spiritual realm. Thus, it is faith that confirms to our hearts that we will be going to a very special place called heaven someday. The Bible is filled with references to the heavenly realm. Our place that is invisible to our eyes physically today, yet very real in existence. We believe with our eyes of our heart, not the eyes of our head. Job is the perfect example of spiritual conflict. So, if it could go wrong, Murphy's Law, it happened to Job in the Bible. Has anybody ever had one of those Murphy Law days? I'm having one right now. So, so Job, again, he's a perfect example of conflict that can manifest in physical forms. Job was a real human, been living here on earth, but the Bible gives us a clear look at what happened concerning Job's life in the spiritual realm. God looked upon Job, and said, this is a righteous man. But because Satan wanted to prove Christ wrong, he decided, eh, I'm going to attack Job today. And so Job became the victim of Satan's attacks. Job's family, finances, and home were destroyed, and his health and friends turned against him. Job experienced very real physical and circumstantial conflicts because of the conflict of the spiritual realm. Job also became the victor because of his faithfulness in God, in God's word and actions throughout the trial and tribulations that he endured. His victory was spiritual, physical, and material on earth as it is in heaven. 
You also read in John 17, that it becomes clear that if we are in the world, but not of the world, we are going to have conflicts. These conflicts are spiritual warfare. Why? Because the physical manifestation of the world, such as the trees, the ocean, and the sky, are not the problem. It's the forces that control the world that are the conflict with God. And we as Christians are God's children. Thus, in the world, in conflict with God, the world also is in conflict with us. And, you know, the prayer of John 17 expresses the heart of Jesus as he uh, knows battle that he will face in the world. And the world hates those that follow Jesus. And I'm not saying the whole world, but we've seen it throughout history. We see it throughout the history of the Bible that Christians are under attack. We are lucky here in America that we get to openly worship. We can come in here and we can sing. Y'all get to sit here and unfortunately listen to me. We get to listen to Steve on most days without any sort of attack. But try to go to a different country. Try to go to a Muslim-controlled country or even Brazil and openly preach out in the streets or have a church and see the attack that they are under as Christians. And so for some of us, the hardest battles of the spiritual warfare are also fought within ourselves. So we've covered spiritual battle, kind of covered the worldly view. Now we're going to start talking about this battle within. And so for some of us, the hardest battles are battles of spiritual warfare fought amongst ourselves. And we can understand the circumstances and the situations that the enemy uses to destroy us. We can understand to some degree that the battles in the spiritual realm is an ongoing, real, even though we cannot see it. But to get a grasp on what is going on within our hearts and minds can be the hardest, most exhausting battle of them all. So have you ever felt overwhelmed? Never felt like sin masters is kind of attacking you and going for you? Yeah, definitely. This week, ear infection kicked up on Tuesday. Trying to get Phil his numbers, which I still haven't emailed you, sorry. Trying to get the youth building painted so that we could have service in there today. And it was just like, none of this is bad, but this is a lot of attacks all at once. Because I'm still trying to finish this sermon for Sunday. Plus the youth lesson. Plus just try to get the youth building completed so it's somewhat manageable. And by the grace of God, we got it done. We had a lot of friends and family kick in and come up and help. And we got to have service in there this morning. Children got to have their new fifth and sixth grade, so God is good. And at the end of the day, everything works out. But going back to that overwhelming feeling, sometimes we have to make that decision according to how we think and feel. And so at times, we struggle with that anger, that bitterness, that hatred, or that just leading to temptation. Like yesterday, by the time we were done up here painting, I just wanted to go home and kick on the TV and sit. I did not want to try to finish this. And I was like, yeah, no, nope, I need to review that. I'm going to be staying in front of a bunch of people tomorrow. But, man, couch and TV sound really good. But that was temptation. And, again, it goes back to it doesn't always have to be bad. But it's a constant fight amongst yourself. And so God tells us that to fight against those with sinful feelings, we must learn to fight against the very nature within us. And Paul tells us in Colossians 3, 8 through 13, that the Lord has given us the spirit who will empower us to overcome, but we must be willing to allow him the authority to be in control of our emotions and our behaviors. We must surrender to Jesus. Now, I think everybody who is a Christian has surrendered, but have we surrendered fully? And that is the hardest part. Surrendering over relationships, finance, life decisions. Do I buy this car? How often do we go to prayer on these little daily things that we should? We're called as Christians to do. I know I've been guilty in the past of, oh, I see that new truck. I'm going to go buy it. I didn't pray about it. Do what? Yeah, Lowe's. Don't send people to Lowe's. Church gets a lot of stuff that they don't need. 
Anyways, everything that occurs in the visible physical world is directly connected to the wrestling match being waged in the invisible spiritual world. The effects of the war going on in the unseen world reveal themselves in our strain and damaged relationships, emotional instability, mental fatigue, physical exhaustion, and many other areas of our lives. How do we come home stressed and we're just short with our spouse, whether we mean to or not? They've done nothing wrong, but we just come home and we're just kind of snappy. You think that's Satan attacking on your relationship? Trying to drive that wedge? I do. And many of us feel, feel pinned down by this anger, this unforgiveness, pride, comparison, insecurity, discord, fear. This list could go on. But the overreaching primary nemesis behind all these outcomes goes back to the greatest deer hunter, the devil himself. So, the root of our biggest problems is spiritually rooted. Did y'all catch that? Our biggest problems are spiritually rooted. But we play it off as, ah, that's just life. That's just the world. This just happens. Work can be tough. This can be hard. Relationships take work. And yes, they do. But it's even harder when the devil's attacking. So how do we combat that? Well, Ephesians 6, 10 through 20, gives us a great way to combat this. And I'm going to start. Y'all can follow along on the board. In the Christian life, we battle against rulers and authorities. The powerful evil forces of fallen angels headed by the devil, who is vicious fighter. To withstand their attacks, we must depend on God's strength and use every piece of the armor. Paul is not only giving the counsel to the church, the body of Christ, but to all individuals within the church. The whole body needs to be armed. As you do battle against the world powers of of darkness, fight in the strength of the church whose power comes from the Holy Spirit. Those who are not flesh and blood are demons over whom the devil has control. They are not mere fantasies. They are very real. We face a powerful army whose goal is to defeat Christ's church. When we believe in Christ, these beings become our enemies. And they try every device to turn us away from him and back to sin. I'm going to stop right there before I continue reading. I'm on the fire department, and one of the greatest things I get to do with that is the honor guard. Well, about 2010, we went and did a burial for a gentleman who had served in World War II. And come to find out, he had been on the USS Arizona. And three of his sailor buddies had shown up, who two had been on the Oklahoma, one on the Arizona. Now, at the time, and my old man knows him, guy's name was Steve Walker, hardcore old school Marine, and it was Marine, other services, civilians. This is kind of how he looked at stuff. And so I knew there was something special about these gentlemen when he popped on and said, go invite them to coffee. Commander Walker, they're Navy, sir. I understand. Go invite them to coffee. Okay. So go over and invite these gentlemen to coffee. Come back, and I'm like, so why are you taking the Navy guys to coffee, Commander? He goes, did you see their vest? And I said, No. Because oh, well, two of them were on the Oklahoma, one was on the Arizona. I fear this will be a good time to talk to them. Great. So we sit down with these gentlemen to have a conversation. And they take the time to make sure that we know God. So we're wanting to take them out to coffee to hear about World War II and Pearl Harbor from firsthand experience. And they're like, no, no, we got something better. We want to share God. And one of the gentlemen said, you know, right after Pearl Harbor, I joined with the bombers. And we would go do bombing runs. And he goes, coming to know Christ as a baby Christian or even as a solidified Christian, it's kind of like being a bombardier on a bomber. He goes, I always looked through the scope, and I was the guy that picked when to drop the bomb. And I always knew we were getting close to the target. Because all of a sudden, it would just get a little black patch, a little black patch, a little more, and then it was just completely black. It was all the flack from them trying to shoot them out of the air. He goes, but as we got over the target, it always seemed to open up. We'd drop our bombs and fly away. 
He goes, coming to Christ is a lot of the same way. As you're going and you're starting to get towards Christ, the devil's just going to start throwing that flack at you, trying to shoot you out of the air, divert you off your path. And that has stuck with me since that day in a coffee shop over in uh, Middle Othian, of all places. And so I've just, I've held on to that. It was very powerful. And it's very true. The devil wants to throw us off course. And he'll do anything in his power to do that. I also thought it was really cool that these gentlemen took their time to make sure we knew God. We got to hear about the Arizona and Oklahoma and very interesting conversation, but the fact that one of the things they wanted to do was make sure everybody was being led to God, it's different in the service. And so it was, it was really cool. So back to our Bible reading. When we believe in Christ, these beings become our enemies and they try every device to turn us away from him and back to sin. Although we are assured of victory, we must engage in the struggle until Christ returns. Because Satan is constantly battling against all who are on the Lord's side, we need supernatural power to defeat Satan. And God has provided this by giving us the Holy Spirit within and using his armor surrounding us. If you feel discouraged, remember Jesus' words to Peter. On this rock I will build my church, and the forces of Hades will not overpower it. How can anyone pray at times like this? Oops, sorry. Missed the whole section. In every situation, take the shield of faith, and with it you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is God's word. Pray at all times in the Spirit and with every prayer and request and stay alert in these with all preservation and intercession for all saints. Pray also for me that the message may be given to me when I open my mouth and make known the boldness, the mystery of the gospel. For this, is, for this I am the ambassador in chains. Pray that I might be bold enough in him to speak as I should. So armor of God, you got the belt of truth, you got the chest plate of righteousness, the shoes of readiness for the gospel, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword, which is the word of God. I believe there's a seventh piece of the armor, and that's prayer. It's mentioned a lot in there. And I believe you can have all these wonderful, powerful, divine gifts from God that make up your armor. But without prayer, you're not going to be able to activate that armor. And so we need to remember to always go to prayer, especially in difficult situations. But we should go to prayer in happy times too. I think we're probably more guilty of when things are going good, we forget to pray. I have a great photo that I was going to put up here today, but it didn't work out real well. And it was a photo of me and my dad. We're both in bunker gear. He's having to stand on a step stool to yell at. It was really funny, so I thought I was going to bring some comic relief to this. But he you got to imagine, he's on this step box, and he's looking down at me to yell at me. Well, his gear's all nice and clean and shiny because he's a chief. And my gear was not so nice, clean, and shiny. But it got me thinking about the armor of God. Where my armor that we wear, bunker gear, we got a helmet, got a Nomex hood, coat, got our suspenders, they act like our belt, got our pants and our boots, gloves. It holds up great at a fire so much. And then it starts breaking down. He's had burns. I've had burns. It's going to fail. But the armor of God, not only is it not going to fail, but it's not going to tarnish. If we remember to put that on and we remember to pray, it's not going to tarnish. Where our worldly gear and armor will, his won't. So when we're fighting this spiritual war with the enemy whose primary tactic is deception, this enemy can be defeated through spiritual resources God provides. And these resources are activated and powered through prayer. Prayer is simply an outpouring of your heart to God and then making room in your life to hear back from him. In his words, and he orchestrates your circumstances. God wants to have a conversation with you. He longs to hear what is really in your heart and wants openness and honesty. So many times when we're talking with the youth, they're like, well, hey, how do we pray? Well, hey, how do we pray? 
It's really easy. It's just a conversation with God. That's all he really is longing for is that one-on-one time. The other thing I hit a lot with the U is when you look at the spiritual armor, the armor of God, it's all forward-facing. There is nothing to protect the back. I personally believe this is for two reasons. One, we shouldn't retreat from sin. We shouldn't turn our back on it. We face it headstrong. Secondly, we should have accountability partners, brothers and sisters in Christ. And they're going to stand to your left and your right and behind you to protect you. And so in battle, spiritual battle, people are going to get wounded. And by that, I mean we're going to fall into temptation. And we're going to have our moments where we slip up. But having a core group of men or women or even like a life group of married couples, whatever it fits in your bracket, to go to and say, hey, I'm struggling with. That's how you face this sin. That's how you face this spiritual battle. And this is how you will conquer. But at the end of the day, the easiest thing to remember is the war's already won. Jesus has already had victory over Satan. And I kind of laugh because I used to have some debates at work with some gentlemen that were um, Jehovah's Witness. And they clicked with me one day. Why am I fighting for the gospel and arguing with them when all I need to do is treat Jesus like the lion he is and open the cage? He'll do all the work. And that's one of the things I like to pass on to you. And I want to pass on to y'all. Because when it comes to the gospel and it comes to spiritual warfare, and it comes to battle, just open the cage. Jesus is a lion. He can defend himself, and he can take care of that for us. The victory's won. And so I'd like to close us in prayer. Father, we just give thanks for being able to openly worship you. We give thanks for your protection throughout the daily spiritual battles that we face, unseen and seen, through the attacks that we may endure, whether we realize they're from Satan or not. And Lord, I just ask that you put it on our hearts to realize that these attacks are of Satan and to be able to notice them so that we can defend ourselves and our Christian brothers and sisters. And Lord, I ask that you help us turn away from the idols of this new age and refocus our hearts anew on you and allow us to come to you fully and glorify you with the honor, respect, and love that you've shown us with your grace. May everything that we do in our lives glorify you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.